One of my favourite places on earth is the Great British Antiques Market. This one is in Shepton Mallet, Somerset. I've been coming to markets like this all my life and I've never lost the interest. You never know what's going to pop up. I had this as a child. My mum and dad had this china when I was little. Going to the high street means you end up buying the same as everyone else, but second-hand shopping is a uniquely personal experience, allowing you to find items that match your style, even if quirky is your thing. Is that a clock? It is a clock. Yes, it it's is. Lovely. The, the, well, you see the fish moving there? Yeah. That's the second hand. Oh, it's yeah. a beautiful thing. I've never seen anything like it before. If you like the shape of something but you don't like the finish, then think about how you might adapt it. For example, if it's not too sacrilegious, you could easily paint a piece of furniture, mix and match lamp bases with shades, or use a damage plate as an ornament on the wall rather than for eating your supper off. That's £10. Those kind of things are so nice for putting toothbrushes or toothpaste in. They just look lovely in a bathroom. If you see something you love, don't ponder over it for too long. Remember, there aren't shelves stacked with them. You may struggle to find another if it gets snapped up. It's very clear and it's been nicely coloured. How much do you want for that? Um, I will do that for £18. There we are. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. One couple who would benefit enormously from a trip to this market are Amanda and John Pierce. Seven years ago, they moved into a house which hadn't been altered since the 1970s, but they've since had three children. Do you think they've had a chance to do much to their house? because I don't. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. Nice Hello. to meet you. I'm Kirsty. Uh, hi. hi. Nice to meet you. Hello. Yeah. Doesn't look completely untouched. Ah, oh, yeah. Come into the kitchen. All oh, right, OK. Amanda and John have two problem areas. The kitchen is a relic of the 1970s, but not in a good way. And the dining room is basically a storeroom with a table in it. There's no denying that these are a pair of pretty joyless rooms. What would you like to see when you walked into this kitchen? Colour. I like colour. Lighter as well. It's very brown. I don't right. want to see brown. Right. Um, I do a lot of work in the kitchen. I make jams, cakes. It's very cluttered, very crowded. Yep. Rumour has it, John, that you're a hoarder. I, I, I do have a tendency to keep things unless they're broken. We're probably going to force you to chuck some things out. You'll be OK. <laughs> This room doesn't work on a functional or emotional level. It needs completely refurbishing. But as part of this rebirth, I want to inspire John and Amanda to make it their own, embracing the second hand and the homemade to make it a place the whole family will enjoy being in. Right, our dining room. Is that what it is? It's what it's meant to be. Yes, cos it looks like a music room, a storage room, uh-huh. It serves many purposes. OK, it serves many purposes. It's a multifunctional room that's supposed to be mainly for dining. You know, you've got three kids, you need space. What would you think if I took the table, turned it and popped it into the window and we had built-in seating in the window? With seats, storage. So with storage underneath. I would really love that. One thing that would be really nice as a, as a present for a man mm -hmm. which you might really enjoy doing, yeah. is copper beating. OK. I thought to make something really beautiful that can hang on the wall and that can be used. Do you fancy that? That sounds excellent, yes. yes. I'm so excited about working on these two rooms because there's going to be such a huge transformation. The dining room needs bringing up to date, but we'll be going to the past for inspiration as we hit the antique markets on a quest for the stylish second hand. My feeling on that is that's two tanks of petrol. It's and yet that's that, something you'd have in your house for life. And Amanda muscles in on John's contemporary copper creation. You must have really strong upper arms. As for the kitchen, this too will be dragged into the 21st century. I want this to be a bright, happy, workable room, but also full of personal items that tell a story. So we'll be getting the whole family involved as we learn the art of tile making. So these are the pictures that the kids did. You're going to cry. I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> there are some days when this job is just a great one to have. Helping Amanda and John make that house into the family home they want it to be is going to be a joy, and I'm really pleased I'm able to do it. 
the last series, we did an online poll to see which crafts you really wanted to learn about. And there was one that was head and shoulders above the rest. Today, I'm going to be doing rag rugging with Debbie Siniska. This is something I've really been looking forward to. I'm armed with some old clothes and I'm going to learn to make something with entirely recycled materials. Rag rugging is one of those great British traditions. For centuries, scraps of unwanted fabric have been woven into hessian sacking and made into rugs that were a lot more cosy than a wooden or stone floor. Now, with so many vibrant coloured fabrics around, this can also be a hugely creative art form and there's no shortage of raw material. We throw away more than a million tonnes of textiles every year and that's an awful lot of rugs that don't get made. Debbie. Hi. Hi! Very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Debbie has been making these beautiful rag rugs for the past 20 years. She runs her own courses and has even sold her creations in the Tate Modern shop. Now it's time to turn my old clothes into a work of art too. So this Ooh. is literally just bits and bobs of different <gasps> things. Together. Do you think that tweedy about, stuff about, is going to work? That'll work as really? well, the, the trousers, aren't they? Trousers is good because it's quite long strips, isn't yes, it? Yes, wonderful. Yeah. That's okay. great. Great materials. Do we get cutting immediately? We will get cutting after we've done our design. OK, right. Because then so you can I'll do your design and back. think about what colours you want. Yeah. We're going to be drawing around a template which you can make out of cardboard. Debbie and I have gone for a tulip shape. The great thing about this craft is that it's cheap. You can even get the hessian sacking from your local pet shop because that's how peanuts arrive. Right, OK, so we've drawn around our templates. So what are we going to do with these squares? Right, well, we're going to fill up the whole square and join them, make lots of squares together. Oh, right. To, if I just stand up and show you that. That is lovely. So basically, lots of squares it's joined like together. A, a square of quilting or a square exactly. of knitting. Yeah. With a view to making a rug that goes as big as you want mm. it to go. Right? Yes. We need to cut our fabric into strips. It feels a bit painful chopping up your old clothes, but when you know they're being transformed into something more beautiful, it makes it a lot easier. This is pure recycling. You could make something that's a memory mat. You can have your old favourite. Yeah, old maternity Jimmy. clothes. Yes, old maternity Wouldn't that be clothes. nice? Old cardies and stuff like that. Just cut them yeah. up and then. I'd love to have a memory mat of all my school uniforms. I went to Absolutely. masses of different schools. <laughs> yes. We're going to be using strips of material that are about four centimetres long, and Debbie has an ingenious way of making them. We're going to wind this around here. This is a little circular cutting gauge yeah. that will give you even little tabs of fabric. Take these scissors and you, you cut along the top and then you get lots of little tabs all the same length. Ah, perfect! Aren't they good? That is the kind of thing I like. And you can make your own one of these using a cardboard tube. Now we're ready to start our rag rug and we're going to be using a technique called proddy. For this, we need a tool called a bodger, which you can pick up for around £15. Once you cut your tabs of fabric, um, you're going to push your tool into the hessian mm -hmm. on the line following the pattern. Mm -hmm. You push it through a couple of stitches and you open up the tool and grab the end of your tab of fabric, pull it halfway through, fold it over, go into the same hole, make a new hole, open and pull it through. Once you've been shown how to do it, it's actually quite easy. You can use pretty much any fabric as long as it's not prone to fraying. To get a different texture to the rag rug, Debbie's now going to show me a second technique, and this one's called hooking. It gives a very nice looped pile effect, and for this, we're using another type of tool. We're using a rug hook for this, and I'm using this nice soft woolen. OK. You push your hook in, and we're going to pinch it over and pull it through. Pull it back through. So then, for that, you have one long piece. You have of... a long strip of fabric right. for your okay. hooking. Let's give that a try. Okay, here's where I fall flat. So you're going to push your hook put in, your hook through, wrap the fabric around the hook, and then you pull it up. Oh, and that's great. They're very different effects, mm. and they use the fabric differently. I like the denseness of this. Now it's just a matter of building up the textures and the colours, whichever way you choose. It's one of those crafts that is really therapeutic, aren't they all? And I particularly like the way you get quick results. It's going to be pink, 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 and then here, just on the 
t a few purple tabs just on the tip mm, of my tulip. That'd be great. The other good thing about these rugs is that if you spill your coffee on it, you can just unpick and patch. In the old days, they actually used to clean rugs by rolling them in the snow to draw out the dirt. That's less than two hours' work, isn't it? We've really broken the back of it. I can see the design right. coming through. The colours work so well together. They really Good do. Good colour scheme. Two hours, a whole new skill, and three old disused pieces of clothing. That's right. Old woolly, old shirt. Old slip. Old, old slip. Being given a whole new life. Fantastic. Of course, this rug needs a few more hours' work in order to finish it. After that, Debbie sews all the squares together. The end result is a stunning rug with a contemporary design. Anyone can do this at home and it costs next to nothing. It's an absolute winner. And it's mine. I have a passion for things that are handmade, but I also love antiques. So I'll be showing John and Amanda just how affordable chic second-hand shopping can be. Do you like it? I like the like simplicity it. of it. Did you get it? Yeah. And I'll also be introducing them to the ancient art of tile making, but with a modern twist. That is amazing! Britain has a long tradition of producing talented craftspeople, but you wouldn't know that when you walk into some people's homes. John and Amanda have a good sized kitchen, but there's next to no useful storage. We need to solve this by finding a good-sized, freestanding piece of furniture to house all of Amanda's cooking paraphernalia. We also need to find a beautiful mirror to go in the dining room. And I know just the place to get one. This is Shepton Mallet Antiques Market. If your idea of retail therapy is shopping centres and fixed-price fancies, then I'm here to prove there is an alternative treatment. This market has over 500 stalls. It only opens for five weekends a year, but it still attracts nearly 25,000 people. I'm with John and Amanda, and we're here to shop, shop, shop. What are you hoping to find today? A nice mirror for the dining room yep. uh, to make a feature, and maybe some nice china, some nice ceramics. For me, the main thing is the dresser still. The dresser, uh, yeah. It's the biggest item that we need. It's, we've got to find the right one, it's the right size. We've got a budget of £500 for the kitchen dresser. And to up our chances of finding a good one, we've roped in our resident antiques expert, Tony Gearing. He's been dealing antiques for over 20 years and knows exactly what he's looking for. About 1880. Look at those dovetails. Much of Tony's knowledge has come from talking to other dealers. Never be shy of asking questions. Better to admit you don't know and learn something than walk away. And this is what, sort of 1890, turn of the century? Yeah, absolutely spot on, mate, without a doubt. It's a common misconception that antique dealers are inclined to rip you off. But the truth is you're more likely to leave with a better made, better value, more environmentally friendly piece of furniture than you'd find on the high street. And how much is this one? Or what it, would be the best? About 450. 450, that's, that's well within our budget. With Tony doing all the hard graft, we're free to concentrate on finding some beautiful crockery and we're not short of choice. Now that's a sort of dream blue and white display, isn't it? This stall sells mostly English pottery, including Minton ware, which was made in Stoke-on-Trent from as early as 1793. Bliss, bliss, bliss. If you bought something like this, would you use it or would you fear for it? Would you I would try and use it, but yeah. I fear that John would be afraid. I mean, let's say... He would be very I'd be, I'd be afraid. afraid you'd try and put it in the dishwasher. I wouldn't put it in the dishwasher. To have something like that in the middle of the table... Rapes, next uh, to the cheese. Yeah. I mean, that, that would be lovely on anywhere, dresser, on the dresser anywhere, yeah. or I in the dining that. room. Excuse me. Sorry. How much is that? Uh, 75. My feeling on that is that's two tanks of petrol. It's and not yet even that's that, something you'd have in your house for life. Okay. Yes, OK. Mm. That's a deal. Thank, Thank you, you very man. much indeed. Thank you. An early 19th century comport at a very good price. Result. But if this isn't quite to your liking, you could always go West Country chic with this Cornish ware. 
It's not cheap at around £20 a jar, but it definitely holds its value, especially the green striped variety, if you can find it. If you're unfamiliar with antiques markets, you might expect them to be a mishmash of unconnected items. But actually, many stallholders specialise in one thing and have a large range on offer. Don and Amanda want a mirror for their dining room, and I've spotted one that I think might be a contender. That's a big mirror. It is, isn't it? I think it's distressed. It could do with a wash, but it would stay distressed. I don't think you'd particularly want to repaint oh, it. Oh, no. No, I think it'd be nice. I think nice. it's very nice. A quick chat with the stallholder reveals that it's on at £135. Do you like it? I like the like simplicity it. of it. Did you get it? Yeah. OK, I'm happy with that. OK, fantastic. John and Amanda are truly embracing the whole antiques market experience. And that mirror. You couldn't get anything near that quality and size on the high street for the same price? Not in a million years. Tony will continue with his search for the perfect kitchen dresser and I can't wait to see what he unearths. We've bought some lovely second-hand items for John and Amanda's kitchen, but now we want to put an even more personal stamp on it by making something ourselves. Which is why we're here to spend the day with Richard Miller, an incredibly talented tile maker. Richard took over this Victorian pottery in Farnham five years ago when he was just 23. The tiles he produces have a texture and appearance that's a world apart from any you'd find on the high street. Today, he'll be helping us make our own bespoke creations, which will be a real feature when the cooker and all the units are replaced. Ceramic tiles have been made by hand for over 4,000 years and can be found in the oldest pyramids and ancient Greek ruins. And they're still produced in pretty much the same way today. So if you take the lump of clay, the first part of the process really that you have to go through, regardless of what you're making, whether it's tiles, pots, you have to wedge the clay. So it's a process of de-airing it. So what you're looking to do is just literally push the clay round like this, so you're just rolling it. And if, uh, if, you, if it's getting a bit unruly, you can always knock it back into a, just like a reasonable it. shape. So the true test is if you take, take a wire and trim through it, you want it to be nice and smooth. Consistent. Absolutely. Air bubbles could cause the tile to explode or bloat in the kiln, so I'm pleased to have got rid of those. We can now flatten the clay into something more workable and roll it out using two pieces of wood to get a consistent thickness. We're using Cornish clay with a high sand content. A pre-made template gives us the right size for a six-inch tile, but it's actually made 8% bigger to allow for the clay shrinking when it dries. Your square is very, very neat, much neater than mine. Mm. But all is not lost. Apparently, there is an easier way of producing these tiles. <gasps> so, cool! And there's your six-inch tile, ready for decoration. Oh, that's much better than all this rolling and slapping! <laughs> there we are! So. I'm a mechanised girl. <laughs> John and Amanda have decided they want to have brick-shaped tiles, so we just chop the ones we've made in half and then smooth them over with some water and what potters call a rubber kidney. The next step is to give the tiles some texture. For this, you can use just about anything that comes to mind as long as it leaves an imprint in the clay. Richard has put together his own collection. What are these? Little seed pods of some description, I'm not absolutely sure. You don't just have to use a one big shape right in the middle, you can use a, a smaller one and repeat it. That's it, um, I mean, it's entirely up to you. You know, there's anything, any of these smaller pieces could be repeated to create larger patterns. I think we're doing pretty well with our first attempt at making a tile, but we won't see these ones for a few days because they have to dry out. Richard will glaze and fur them after we've left. But so that we can actually see something nearer to completion, we're going to use a method that is absolutely inspired. John and Amanda's children have drawn some pictures and we're going to put them on some pre-made tiles. So these are the pictures that the kids did? Yeah. Absolutely. <gasps> oh, look! These are just adorable. Oh, they're so sweet! Aren't they just fabulous? That's the, That's whole, family. the whole family? Yeah. Oh, and the ladybird and a house. So, they actually look fantastic. I'm so wonderful. excited about this. It's really funny. I particularly like John's hair. 
<laughs> Spiky hair. Thing. I thought it was a crown. <laughs> was his hair. King, king of the household. This is such a clever thing. The drawings were scanned, resized, printed, and then enameled, making a sort of transfer. This digital ceramic process costs less than £20 for an A3 sheet. There are lots of specialist printers who do it. All we have to do is cut them out and fix them to the tile. So this is actually the same ladybird repeated? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. When they're put in water, this releases them from the backing paper. The remaining transparent film will just burn off in the kiln, leaving the image bonded to the tile. Nice. <gasps> Wow, you can see exactly you take... what it's going to look like. Look. That's just so lovely. You don't... I mean, so often with these things, you have to wait until it's fired mm. to see what That's you're going to get. This instant gratification. Instant <laughs> gratification. That is amazing. And the thing is, it's, it's such a... I mean, I was there when they drew them, and now they're going to be put onto these permanent things, and... You're going to cry. I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> You're going to cry. She's going to cry. <laughs> I know that tissues are, but it's just, that's going to be forever. That's yeah. just, oh, it will be forever. It's lovely. It's just. Yeah, when it's taken you this long to get John to do work to the house, it's got to be forever. <laughs> <laughs> that's absolutely true, isn't it? Richard will now fire the tiles at 1,280 degrees centigrade, which will bond the ceramic image to the glaze. If you fancy making your own tiles, there are some very good courses up and down the country. Or if you understand the basics but don't have a kiln, try chatting up your local potter. There's more information on our website, channel4.com slash fourhomes. This is the ultimate craft. It combines Richard's skill and the ancient art of tile making, the naive art of a child, the technology, the modern technology of the transfers, and it's got the real heartwarming factor. Mums, grands, aunties of the world unite. This is the ultimate present. It can go in any room in the house and will probably go in every room in the house. Amanda and John are starting to embrace the homemade way and that means thinking differently about the environment they want to live in. So, to keep them on track, I'll be sending them off to learn how to shape a flat bit of copper into a beautiful bowl. Give it some welly. You must have really strong upper arms. <laughs> and I'll be heading back to school to learn how to turn a lump of wood into a beautiful candlestick. Allegedly. Very different from filing my nails. When you're embarking on a room-by-room -room revamp, the temptation is just to whip out the credit card, hit the high street and buy a load of new stuff. I don't want this for Amanda and John's home because it's expensive and impersonal. My contribution is to make something for their dining room that comes from part of John's history. I'm here at St Albans School where John was a pupil and for his gift, I'm gonna try my hand at wood turning. And wood turning is not for wimps. There are lathes, drills, chisels, hammers and danger around every corner. I'm very apprehensive, but I think I'll be fine under the watchful eye of woodwork teacher, Mr Stewart. Today I'm joining class 4A. They've been very busy designing their own wooden candlesticks. I'm going to try and make one too, and they'll all end up in John and Amanda's house. They're lovely. But, uh, they've got a few ideas there. They've got a lot of ideas. I wanted to see your ideas. Well, I have to say... I'm not sure I could compete. Mr Stewart has been teaching for over 40 years. The craft of wood turning dates back a little further than him, to 1300 BC. There are representations in Egyptian tombs of people shaping decorative objects using hand-operated machinery. There are hundreds of different kinds of wood, all with their own individual texture and pattern. And you can get some lovely designs when different woods are glued together and then turned. It's extraordinary how this does, doesn't feel to be any line at not all. Not at all, no. no, not at all. I mean, that's, that's just lovely. Perfect join. Yep, that's mm. just beautiful. Mm. Chirac, one of the pupils, has made a big effort to design the simplest possible candlestick suitable for a novice like me. We're using oak, and it should end up looking like an egg cup, but holding a tea light. Right, guys, should we um, learn how to make these things on the lathe? Would you like to join us, Kirsty? I'd love to. Thank Good. you very much. That'd be fantastic. Rest your hand on there. 
and, uh, rest your hand on there. Doesn't matter whether you're left-handed or right-handed, just lightly then, just, just a light tickle. Oh, no, Go careful. On. I'll do it, I'll do it. Go on then. That's it. I just slide along. Ooh. And basically that, that, that is wood turning. Surely it can't be that easy. Now, let me see something. When you do it, let me see what happens. Ah. The idea is that you need to apply enough force with the chisel to evenly shave the wood, but not so much that it digs in, which could result in the piece of wood flying off across the classroom, which wouldn't impress Mr Stewart. Now that I've got my block of wood into a cylinder, I can smooth off any small bumps with sandpaper. Very different from filing my nails. The next step is to mark the cylinder so we know where the top and bottom of the candlestick will be and also to give us a guide when we're shaping it. Do you want to have a go? No, that's no, fine, Nora. You, you go sure? for it. You keep going. Yeah, you're doing well. I'm determined to do this because I think Mr Stewart thinks I can't. Just like rag rugging, the term bodger crops up in wood turning. These were men who lived in forests, felled the trees and made chair legs and spindles. The word bodger originates from the fact that they never got to complete a full chair. With the exception of glass blowing, it feels like the most dangerous craft I've ever done. Oh, oh shit. Don't go. She went too far in. Yes, I dug the chisel in too far. Mr Stewart steps in and does some skillful shaping and Chirac smooths it off. Thank God they were there to rescue me. If you want to have a go at wood turning, I think it might be advisable to start off with a course. And they exist up and down the country, but once you know how, you can buy a small lathe for just over £100. Do you have a sense that you're passing this on to another generation? What I'd like to pass on to the, uh, the, the boys is the enjoyment of making things. I, I think everyone does, basically. But, um, if I think everyone get... does if they get the chance. Yeah, what I've right. found right. is that a lot of the people I've worked with have never had the chance to mm. make anything. They've mm. never had a teacher like you to give them the confidence that yeah. they can make something. Once the basic shape of the candlestick is done, the wood is given a coat of wax to seal it and really bring out the grain. Then the hole that the tea light will sit in is drilled out. A bit more wax and we're done. There are few things more satisfying than taking a block of wood and crafting it into a smooth, beautiful object. But, argue with me if you want, wood turning is for boys. It's fast, it's noisy, it's scary, and at any moment you could lose a lot more than a nail. Back at John and Amanda's house, work is well underway. In the dining room, the wooden floor is being repaired and the fireplace is being taken out. A cast iron one is arriving shortly. The beautiful tiles we made with Richard have arrived, so now John and Amanda can work out how they should be arranged above the cooker. Uh, I think we've, got to, we've got to go for some sort of even patterns. So. The walls in the kitchen have been replastered and some of the new units are in. They've bought a second-hand canopy for above the cooker, which will eventually be painted black. It's going to go up uh, about four inches higher as oh, well. Oh, is it? So that will raise it up. So. Oh, that's perfect, then. Yeah, that's perfect. It's all going very well, but there's one important item that we still need to find for the kitchen, and that's an impressive dresser. Our resident antiques expert, Tony Gearing, has been scouring Shepton Mallet Market and tapping his wealth of knowledge to find us a good one for less than £500. There are some things it's helpful to know if you're buying antique furniture. Often the handles aren't original. People updated their furniture by changing the handles in the same way that we alter our kitchen units. The original glass, you can see the, the undulations in the old glass that's there. You can date a dresser by looking at the base of the drawers. If the wood runs front to back, then it's probably pre-1750. After that date, they realise that placing them left to right would reduce the impact of shrinkage. We've met up again with John and Amanda so they can judge the fruits of Tony's labour. So, Tony, what have you got for us? Well, we've got um, this pine dresser. It's originally Hungarian. Um, probably about 1900, 1910. 
I quite like the look of that, yeah. having the, the space under it. How much is that, Tony? Four fifty. Mm. The pine would cost you half that. Do you feel warm towards it? I do like the natural finish. I can just see my, my nice tins of flour and my, my baking things all, all in oh, there. Yeah. You know, I, I kind of like that. We got some other choices, Tony. Yes. Well, let's see what our options are. The next one isn't a dresser, it's a wardrobe. But if the top two panels were glazed, it would take on a whole new lease of life. It just shows, when you come to a place like this, it's good to keep an open mind. So... It's English, about 1880. We've got a huge amount of storage, but what, what I think is great about this is the price. It's £150. So how much... Are... Well, a, a glass, I guess, 10, 10 or £15 pounds a, a pane. Um, I wouldn't charge anything to fit it. It's going to take half an hour to fit. Do you want thinking time, John? I think, of the two, in terms of practicality, that's better. If Tony can do his magic on the cupboard, then I'd be more than happy to go with it. Hey, yes. Wow, there you go. John is in a very decisive mood, and I think he picked the best one. All in all, a truly successful day. I want John and Amanda to have in their home personal items that tell a story. So I thought they could make a decorative centrepiece of copper which would sit proudly on their dining room table. Copper beating is one of Britain's oldest crafts. Remnants of jewellery have been dated to around 8,700 BC. And one person who's keeping this tradition alive is award-winning coppersmith Sean Evans. I've arranged for John and Amanda to pop down to her idyllic workshop in Hastings. Hello, nice to meet you. I'm, I'm Sean. Sean has been crafting these beautiful copper ornaments for over 20 years. Dishes, pots and even pieces of contemporary art. OK, so I'm going to show you today how to make a smaller version of the bowls that I make here. That's fantastic. Really and nice. the first thing that we do is cut out a circle from sheet and we're going to start forming that to make the bowl. Mm -hmm. Copper is such a lovely material to work with. And the thing I like about it is there's a different tool for every part of the job. It's a bit of a flat bowl, though, isn't it? It is a bit flat. You know? <laughs> that isn't going to hold a lot, is it? It's not. <laughs> <laughs> to put that right, we'll need to hammer it into shape. But first, it's got to be heated. What this does is loosen up the copper, making it more malleable and easier to work with, a process called annealing. OK. I'm going to turn the flame right up. And then we're heating in a circular motion. The idea is to heat the copper until it glows a cherry red. It's this part of the process that starts to give the copper some of its coloration. And it's really quite beautiful. When it's fully up to temperature, it's dunked in a bath of water. All very satisfying. Wait, when you heat it and it's glowing. It's so elemental. Uh, it isn't is, it? it's amazing. It's the next stage is to give the copper a good beating, and for this, it's put into a cast iron mould called a former. So, holding the hammer, the mallet, sort of halfway up, we're just going to turn. And this is blocking out. This is what we call blocking out. Occasionally, the copper needs to be heated up again so it remains malleable. The technique is a balance between precision tapping to establish the curve of the bowl and good old brute force. Put a bit of pressure in the That's it. Give it some welly. I'd say this was the perfect craft to do if you're in a bad mood. Although copper beating has been around for centuries, there are very few people nowadays that teach it. Classes are quite rare, but they do exist and can be incredibly rewarding. You must have really strong upper arms. <laughs> the next stage is to make a base. A strip of copper is bent into a circle and shaped before being soldered to the dish. Now we're ready for some decoration. So in order to make nice, fine, twisty ends, either it's up to you, you can make a little spiral or, or sort of like a tendril, we're going to file the little points onto the ends of either pieces of, okay. of this wire. 
and that's going to be shaped nicely to sit in there and that's, that'll be our last bit of soldering today. John and Amanda are making some Celtic-style twirls just like the ones on some of Shan's beautiful bowls. I think it'll look okay. Together, it looks really nice. Yeah. I think we're there. I think we're there, chaps. We give everything a bit of a clean, then the decoration is soldered into place. We thought about setting a stone. Would you like me to do that? Yes, absolutely. So, uh, we've before. got a, a sort of little um, rose quartz. And, yeah, uh, I just think Rose quartz nice. means love. Well, the thing is, we've made this together, and whenever, whenever we see that, you know, we're going to know how much effort and time and energy has, and love, in many ways, has gone into it. Mm. And that's going to be a really nice reminder, really nice, every time we see that. That'd be lovely, that's great. Won't it? Thank, Thank, you Thank you very much. Sean will now file off the sharp edges, set the stone and polish the dish before it arrives at John and Amanda's home. If you want to find out more about copper beating, check out our website, channel4.com slash fourhomes. Amanda and John's homemade home is almost complete. We can now concentrate on the last minute details. We get to unwrap our unique creations. Oh, oh, wow. Some of which are more successful than others. Oh. That's the one I made. Wood turning is not my finest hour. And I find out just how well we've done in turning their tired house into a homemade home. I walk in and feel like it's been home for ages. I like being in here, just being in here. It's taken three months to carry out the work on John and Amanda's house, and today they're putting the finishing touches to it. John and Amanda's house needed many of the essentials, a new boiler, new electrics, repastering. But more than that, it needed their family's characters written large across every wall in the house. There's been a huge transformation to their house, and I've brought along some cherries for the top of the cake. You know, John, that I went to your old school, St Albans School, for the afternoon. And oh, I bet we they love that. made these candlesticks. Oh, my That's word. Fantastic. I have to admit something. That's it amazing, was that one. That's fantastic. The oh, most scary thing I've ever done. <laughs> it is absolutely terrifying. The thing just spins at the speed of light. There's all these sharp tools. There's, I had sawdust in places I didn't know existed. But. It just feels amazing. Oh, wow. That's the one I made. Wood turning is not my finest hour. <laughs> so I can just see those now across the fireplace. At the bottom of this box is something that I had absolutely nothing to do with. Oh! Oh, Sean's ball. Uh, oh, wow! <gasps> oh, my word. That has come up beautifully. That is fantastic. Look what it yeah. says on the bottom. Yes, it's got our initials yeah. on and the date. That's lovely, isn't so it? So nice. Yeah. And to think that you could, you know, you can make something like that. And the thing is, because, because it's handmade, there will never be another one like no. that. Never. When I first arrived, this dining room was just a storeroom with a table in it. John and Amanda didn't have the time or confidence to know what to do with it. But I think they've been on an amazing journey together. And this room now looks wonderful. We've replaced the old fireplace with an elegant cast iron one we found for £300. The candlesticks and the children's tiles look great as does the blue and white fruit bowl we bought for £75 at the market. We've kept their original table, but maximised the room around it by building in a window seat, which also provides storage. And the antique mirror we bought for £135 looks perfect above their old sideboard. The cupboards and shelving either side of the fireplace are not only practical, but it means there's a place for all their favourite personal items, including the gorgeous copper dish they made. The repair on the original floor did cost a thousand pounds, but a new one would have cost nearer to six, and it's in a different league to the swirly carpet they used to have in here. This room is now brighter, more welcoming, and one the whole family can enjoy. Before we have a good look around the kitchen, I've got one more thing that I'd like Amanda and I to make. 
we're going to be etching original designs onto glass jars. You make lots of jam and stuff, I so do. you'd love decorated jars. Yes. And I want to have the ultimate salad dressing jar, which has marked on it a quarter vinegar and three quarter sunflower oil. I'm going to make a big one for when we've got guests and a small one with my initials on it for every day. Etching or frosting glass was done in the 15th century by physically scratching into it. But the easier method of using acid gained popularity in the 1860s, and that's what we are going to be using today. We cut shapes out of sticky back plastic and put them on the glass. It'll be these areas that will remain clear when we brush on the acid. The more you do these things, the, the happier you are to just, you know, you become a kind of give-it-a-go crafter. The handmade, there will be unique imperfections to it. It's not going to be mass-produced, identical. No one else is going to have that. No. They might have something that looks kind of similar. No, exactly. My M will always be slightly wonky. <laughs> KMA? Kirsty Mary Alsop. Ah. When you're brushing on this acid, always wear gloves. You should really wear goggles as well and paint it on pretty generously. Leave it for at least a minute before dunking the glass in water. Make sure you get all the acid off and then peel off the sticky back plastic. Oh, look. That, oh, look. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can see the sunflower. <gasps> OK, that is really nice. Pairs well, off and pairs on really shows. Oh, that is Well done, you. I love this. This is such a great craft to try at home and you can recycle all your old jars. If you put colourful sweets in them and tie some pretty fabric on top with a ribbon, they'll make a lovely present. Amanda loves cooking and her kitchen is very important to her and all the family. But when I first arrived, the room didn't work on any level. It was outdated, there was nowhere to put anything and the main colour was brown. But now it is totally transformed. They wanted colour and they wanted light and this beautiful kitchen provides both. The cabinets and the cooker have been replaced and a new slate floor has been put in. The old wooden cupboard Tony found us for £150 at the market looks fantastic with the replacement glass and now Amanda can display all her favourite crockery, a lot of it bought for less than a tenner at a local charity shop. The handmade towels we created look fantastic and go perfectly with the recycled canopy which was bought at an online auction for £50. An old wooden box we picked up from the greengrocers makes a fantastic fruit bowl. And Amanda found some fabric she really liked for the blinds. John and Amanda now have a kitchen they can be proud of that will last for many, many years. It's amazing. Isn't it nice? It's absolutely flaming staggering. The thing is, it's still got that... It's Although it's new, yeah. I walk in and feel like it's been home for ages. I like being in here, just being in here. Do you think it's changed the way you look at objects and yes. things in your home? It's not just objects. It's like you walk past charity shops and you see something which we would have walked past and not, we probably wouldn't even looked at or noticed before. And you're looking at it and think, that would look really good, you know, in, in on the dresser where it's going to catch the light or it's going to go just the right colour and you, you, you'd you see things very differently. The things, funnily enough, which probably are giving you most pleasure are not necessarily the most expensive things. Yeah. John, I very often find that I slightly have to drag the men into the crafts kicking and screaming. That actually hasn't been the case for you. You were very enthusiastic about the tiles and mm. I gather very enthusiastic about the copper beating. But what do you think you got out of the crafts? I think it was nice to meet people who are obviously very keen and passionate about what they do uh, and, and, and to be part of that. C could you see yourself saying, right, on Thursday nights, Amanda, the kids are yours, I'm going to go and do this course? I think so. I, mean, I think that there are it gives you the idea that um, there are things to try and at least experience rather than just concentrate on what you do just part of your job. Yeah. Uh, to step outside of your normal activities. We've created two beautiful rooms, but that isn't the half of it. What's happened with John and Amanda is their entire relationship with this house has been altered. For many people with young kids, the strain of work and life means you're just going from day to day. 
The thought of going out and learning a craft is as likely as winning the lottery. But when you do, the results can be really extraordinary. This home is all them, and I want your home to be all about you. I've had so much fun sharing my passion for crafts and buying second-hand <laughs> with families and craftspeople from all over the country. It's beautiful. I'm so impressed. <laughs> wow. Oh, my goodness. Oh, wow, that is amazing. <laughs> Look at it. I hope I've inspired you to do something special for your home. Oh, you think? Yeah. Wow. Susie said I nearly cried when I saw his work. Oh, did he? All of the crafts we have featured on this series can be found on our website, channel4.com slash fourhomes.